No, 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 no. So it's P R R, right? Because it, it's Popat, rings, right. we got and ropes. Welcome back to another episode of Sound 101. I'm Andrew from Native Microphones, and this episode again is with Deity Steve. Hello. I love it. So, our first question comes from Clementine Productions, which also means that Clementine Productions are the proud winners of a Vila. Yes, there you are. Also, leave some questions below in this one, so we have more mailbag episodes for next month, and you could potentially win a Vila of like Clementine. So, what does Clementine have for us? Is there ever an appropriate time to use an on-camera mic for capturing audio? Ah, okay, so I know this question because this was actually dropped in our Lover Shotgun, we're Lav 1. And the question for that was in an interview. So now the question is, well, when is an on-camera microphone appropriate? Almost all the time. And in perfectly honest, a microphone on your camera is never gonna hurt anything. You don't have to use the audio. But at the same time, you may actually find that the audio on the camera is perfectly fine for the video production. Maybe you are a videographer out there and you wanna film some B-roll of someone using software on a laptop. There's two ways you can capture that audio. You could do it with a boom pole. Okay, but you're a videographer. You may not have the budget, or you may not have the, the manpower. So, on camera mic, perfectly acceptable. Right, and at the end of the day, with the cost of an on-camera shotgun, like a D3 being just $100, if you can have that instead of your onboard camera mic, like yeah. you're immediately way more prepared to do audio for this shoot. So I would say it's always appropriate. The real question is, when should you exclusively be using an on-camera mic? B-roll. Like, when you're shooting a wedding, and you were like, yeah, just roaming around and she's getting her makeup done, talking to her friends. You don't want to disturb anyone and say, hey, can I have to lob on you real fast? Yeah. Just let them have fun. Let them live in that moment. The on-camera microphone is going to capture all your sound there. And it's going to be wonderful. And it's going to be better than the omnidirectional built-in mic in your DSLR. Sounds good. Next question. Okay, this one's actually for you, Steve. And the question is from Isha Indra. What's the best way to organize files for a Foley session as we all know, audio does not have thumbnails like video files. It's a great question. File organization is a very important and uh, very seldom talked about part of post-production. It's not sexy, so no one wants no, to talk about it. Certainly not. I think the easy answer is whatever way is best for you. Whatever way Absolutely. you're gonna be able to keep track of all your files, uh, especially if you are on a lower budget thing and you find yourself being the Foley artist, the audio engineer, and the sound mixer at the end of the day. Whatever works in your universe is fine. If you are gonna be sending out your files, I would recommend kind of abiding by some rules. We haven't done this ourselves, but we found a list of really in-depth fully sound terms that you can add to your file names or track names. Everything down to uh, the type yeah. of shoe type you're of wearing. Shoe. Was it a sneaker? Was it a leather hard sole? What kind of surface the shoe was yeah. on? Right, concrete or gravel, and all of this yeah. is is contained within maybe even the file name. So yeah, so you it's can... like metadata in the file name, correct? Right. It's similar to when you're script writing an ext is exterior. It's it's mm -hmm. that kind of shorthand that could really help you out. So if you do plan on making a career out of Foley, I would absolutely look into that. If it's you and your friends, I think you could get away with a little bit less intense file naming, but it's good practice. What kind of folder structure would you use? I would say you could probably break it up by scene and then character. Yeah. That would likely be the easiest way to do it. So oh, I would do it. Scene one yeah. and then Andrew, and then within the Andrew folder, I would do his footsteps, maybe your hand touches, and then a prop pass or a cloth pass. So maybe four tracks within the Andrew folder within scene one. There you go. Another question for you, Steve. Back-to-back -back questions. And this one is from Curtis Judd. So this is not an easy question, and I gave it to Steve. This is an extra credit question. Yeah, this is definitely an extra credit question. It's a three-parter, too. So it's very Curtis. All right, Curtis. What does it mean when two microphones are out of phase? What does it sound like, and how do we fix it? This is a great question because we have talked about phase and phasing issues a lot. It's the reason we abide by that three to one ratio when we're doing stereo AB pairs, but we haven't actually explained it. So perfect timing, Curtis. Thank you. Also, thanks. This would happen when you have two microphones recording the same audio source and mm -hmm. there is a minor timing issue. So okay. perhaps one of them is a little bit further away from the source than the other. So we know what waveforms look like. Positive sine wave and like a, a negative sine wave. Right. So when you have two waveforms coming from the same source and they are slightly off, phase cancellation would start to happen. When the waveforms aren't perfectly lined up like this, they're a tiny bit off. 
Ah, so what you're saying is the secondary source is now getting the positive wave and the first source is already moved on to like starting the negative wave. Exactly. So the two are starting to kind of not line up anymore. Right. What does that sound like though? It sounds like 70s music. We're familiar with the intentional use of a phaser, uh, which is... Uh, What's a phaser? It's a guitar pedal, right? Yeah, it is a, a guitar pedal. And what that does, I believe, is it intentionally shifts a waveform across another waveform. They'll come in and out yeah. of phase, and then you can, depending on how fast the frequency of the phase effect is, it'll be faster or slower. When they're far apart, it would sound incredibly uh, dissonant and kind of melty. And then as they come into phase, it would sound perfect, and then it would go the other way. Yeah, it's very much 70s music. So that's how it would work in music and with a, I mean, with a guitar pedal, but in an in interview situation, we're both wearing a lav. That's a possible phase oh, issue yeah. as well. It's a very big phase issue, and I deal with this all the time when I do sit-down interviews, and two people are sitting next to each other looking at the same person, so they're extra tight on camera, and omnidirectional lavalier, so I am picking up the person next to me. What ends up happening to the human voice is it starts to sound very robotic. It starts to sound very hollow and kind of artifact and you could hear it in the voice. It doesn't sound human is the best way to really describe this. The easiest way to fix it now, well, in our situation with lobs, I can literally just go to my Zoom F8 and just flip the phase of one of my channels right. and it fixes it like that. Which is phase inversion. On some uh, DAWs, it's even a button that you click. It's usually a symbol yeah. of an O with a line through it. Click that yep. and it inverts the phase. Any other way to fix it? I mean, just move the distance apart, right? Yeah, abide by the three to one. That's our, it's becoming our golden rule. Absolutely. So next question is for you, Andrew, coming from William Scoff. Thank you, William. What tape is the best for mounting directly on a person's skin and what tape is best for cloth? Ah, wonderful. So the one that we found that we've liked, at least in our preliminary test, is Nexcare's Soft Sensitive Skin. And what was really nice about it was it's low adhesive, yet it still felt very sticky enough to hold down lavaliers, but not sticky enough to where it left residue on the skin. What about tape for cloth? Right now, I always kind of use the lowest adhesive tape possible in dealing with cloth because sometimes you're dealing with silk and sometimes you're dealing with something that's really durable like denim, right? And the two kinds of cloth are completely different. And at the same time, if they're gonna be outdoors and it's hot and that adhesive is gonna get kind of gooey, it's gonna get absorbed by that cloth. Yeah. So the least amount of adhesive I can get away with on a tape, the better. So I don't wanna ruin anything that is fabric on set. And again, test. Do lots of tests on your own skin, on your own fabric. Also, when you apply tape to someone's skin and you wire it all up, you should know what it's like to have to pull that off. Be gentle when you put it on someone. And our last question comes from Dan Svoboda. What is the difference between TRS and TRRS? And what witchcraft do the microprocessors do on your mics? I believe he's talking about our video mic series, VLOB and the D3s. Let's talk about first part of this question. That's the TRS versus TRRS. What is the difference? The R. Because here's the thing, those are acronyms, tip ring sleeve and tip ring ring sleeve. So a TRS is left, right, and then ground. And then TRRS is typically, and this is why we sometimes we have to have the compatibility charts. Typically, typically it is left, right, ground, microphone. And microphone meaning microphone level signal. And worth mentioning while we talk about it because I didn't know this for years. When you're looking at the pins, I always thought that these small black lines, that was actually the connection. And no. that's what was counting. But no, that was the insulator. Right, that's, that's separating the connection. I believe this is a common misconception and I'm not just an idiot, but yeah, that's possible common. too. Uh, it's actually the metal on either side. So when you talk about tip ring sleeve, the tip is the metal above that first insulator. Ring, obviously the middle in between those two insulators and then sleeve on the bottom. Absolutely. So how, what's the connection between the microprocessors and these TRRS? This, this is gonna get real technical with mathematics and voltage. It's a real Curtis Judd question, Dan. <laughs> So there is actually sensors on every single pin. So there's a sensor on the T, R, R, and S. And they're sitting there trying to detect voltage on the audio jack. Now that's not phantom power. Most people often confuse this also. That they go, oh, well, there's phantom power in, in the jack. And I'm like, that's, thank you, but it's, it's not. It's actually called bias voltage. And the layman's term is called plug-in power. 
So when you plug in, say a VLOV into a phone, there is no voltage on the tip, the ring. There is a little voltage called bias voltage on pin number four. And that sensor recognizes the, the fact that it's positive bias voltage and that that's the audio pin. And it lines up its audio signal of the lavalier over to that pin and moves the audio from pins one and two, like a DSLR wants, over to pin four. Hey, really yeah. technical answer. It, it, it is truly uh, witchcraft. This episode was chock full of information. I don't think we had a single joke. Uh, well question at least yeah no i offered to give you the close i'll do it fine don't forget like follow and subscribe on all social media platforms we are here weekly on this youtube channel and leave us a comment below if you have a question that you want to see in a future mailbag episodes you could win a vlov or we could just drop some great knowledge on you thank you for watching i'm andrew from dd my friends and remember he is always deity steve